will now introduce Jesse Boyer, who is our, our presenter today. Jesse Boyer is a Cree, is Cree Métis and a member of the Michelle First Nation. She is the Indigenous Studies and Anthropology Librarian at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, um, which is situated on Blackfoot territory and within the Treaty 7 region. Her research looks at Indigenous perspectives on information literacy, supporting language revitalization, and building capacity for oral history sharing and digitization for communities. She's interested in creating ongoing research relation and ongoing research relationships using kinship and has supported the research of Map the System since 2017. Um, so join me in welcoming Jesse Boyer. Um, Jesse, you should have access to share your screen to bring up your presentation. That's great. Thanks, Tash. All right, let me get this up and I will we'll dive right into it. Um, so I'll just introduce myself in my own language. Thanks in the Tempic Jesse Natsiga Sun Kalukotinia Maganugan of the Squinic and Tugana Masnaig anyway. Um, like Tash was saying, I'm an Indigenous librarian. I, um, I work at Mount Royal. I've worked at Mount Royal for a couple of years now, since 2012, and I've supported Map the System in a variety of different ways, um, working with a number of teams that we'll look at sort of at the end. Um, really what I wanted to talk to you today is about how to begin this sort of research, because in many ways, it's so extensive, right? I mean, colonialism, is a series of systems. And so in many ways, we sort of want to pin it down into one thing. Oftentimes we talk about it as an event, right? The process of colonization. But colonialism versus colonization is the ongoing experience of that, right? And so there's, it looks different in different places, but we'll just delve into what that sort of looks like. So this is sort of our time today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about what is colonialism. There's a variety of different um, definitions that go into a lot of different detail. And depending on how you're situating your work, you might wanna use different, different definitions, right? If you're looking at an issue kind of focused in a particular region, it's really helpful to have someone's perspective on what colonialism looks like in that space. But we'll talk about a general concept. We're going to talk about it as a system and sort of how it functions. Um, Tash had mentioned processes of the sort of the goals of these systems. And so keeping that in mind as we map these things out. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the process of settler versus immigrant, which um, Eve Tuck and Kei Wing Yang help us think through, because what it does is really helps us understand um, time period, right? And the way and, and the, the way that that kind of emerges when we think about colonialism and just generally sort of human migration, right? Sometimes we can simplify those ideas. We're gonna speak about situated knowledges or land-based knowledges, right? The way that um, these knowledges that sit in places often get supplanted by colonialism. And we'll talk about some tips and then I'll leave a space for us for the Q&A. So this is a very, um, simplified definition of colonialism, but it's one that I think is really interesting because it actually comes to us from Teen Vogue, right? So it came from the Teen Vogue syllabus on colonialism, and I, I like it because it's an accessible definition, right? So they're really thinking about it here as controlled by one power over a dependent area or people. And I think what's really helpful there is that it's talking about the practice of invasion and the control it's important that land is kind of the central concern here and sending people, so sending people from the colonial power to live on that land. And obviously for those of us that live in Canada and North America, we have a lot of experiences. We understand kind of what that looks like in our own spaces, but colonialism happens all over the world, continues to happen and happens frequently in waves, right? There are different waves of colonialism that have happened. There's largely two waves that we can keep in mind. One is sort of the, push into North, the North Americas, right? The push to um, access kind of the new world. And then we also have the push into Africa as well, right? So this is specifically European kind of global ideas around colonialism in these two spaces that we often talk about within this framework. Now, colonialism is a series of systems. And so we're look, gonna look at Patrick Wolf's definition here first, right? And Patrick Wolf is looking at genocide. He's looking at the process of um, ridding a place of people, right? And so colonialism, it, his work really reminds us that there is a violent logic to it, right? That it's, it's frequently making 
land empty of people or of history in order to supplant something new, right? And in this way, it's not an event, right? It's, it's not simply the process of colonization, the moment of contact. Instead, it's a structure, right? It's, it's a process that, that, that happens. And so he says here, when invasion is recognized as a structure rather than an event, its history does not stop. Ra uh, <laughs> or more to the point, it became become relatively trivial when it moves on from the area, era of frontier homicide. So I'll just pause. Oftentimes when we talk about um, sort of the, the challenges of colonialism, we talk about how awful things were in the past without sort of seeing the way that that system has continued to emerge and without being able to map that on, right? Sometimes we sort of put a pin in it in a time period without sort of seeing that. So I'll continue with this quote. A logic that initially informed frontier killing transmutes into different modalities, discourses and institutional formations as it undergirds the historical development and complexification of settler society. So an example of that that we can see is um, slave patrols in America turning into police, right? And so that shift from um, the need to, do, to control a particular community, even kind of the, the Indian killing wars, we kind of see that shift into a process of police, right? And so we can see that the way that that system, that and those structures continue into our own kind of, our, our own contemporary space. So Patrick Wolf, if you're someone who kind of is thinking through, well, what does this look like in terms of um, the structure? I really encourage you to look at that work. Um, and he's really focusing on sort of the genocidal component of it that remains to today. The second thing to consider is that colonialism is not sort of simply the process of someone coming to a new place, right? And so Bell Hooks speaks about this as interlocking systems of domination. And, and she says here, I began to use the phrase in my work, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, because I wanted to have some language that would actually remind us continually of the interlocking systems of domination that define our reality. All of these things actually are functioning simultaneously at all times in our lives. So rarely, and as someone, as people mapping this out, rarely is sort of simply the patriarchy, the only system that is impacting our issue, right? Frequently, we also have to look at the way that white supremacy functions in tandem with it, right? They're, they're co-constituted, they come about at the same time. We have sort of bigotry on its own, sort of not, it, it rarely kind of exists in that way. It's often tied with things like land theft, right? So these interlocking systems of domination when we consider that. So for this section, we really just wanna think of colonialism as a system that is ongoing, right? It didn't happen just once, but it's an ongoing process. And also that it's interlocking, right? That these systems of domination that make up colonialism and that colonialism is part of are all kind of connected to each other. So this is from um, Tuck and Yang's article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. And oftentimes when we think about colonization, it can get tied up in human migration, right? Human movement. But we wanna be very clear in this, right? The processes that enable human movement rely on a lot of different things, right? And so in it, they say that settlers are not immigrants. Immigrants are beholden to the indigenous laws and epistemologies of the lands they migrate to. Settlers become the law, supplanting indigenous laws and epistemologies. And so we can see that through the process of colonization and, and ongoing colonialism, those indigenous laws and epistemologies become supplanted. And in our mapping, it's important to be able to identify what has actually been supplanted, right? What existed before? What sort of um, belongs to the spaces that we will be doing this work in, right? Tuck and Yang do a lot of work in this article, which I highly recommend in thinking about what do we mean when we talk about decolonization, right? And they're very specific in saying that decolonization is not sort of all the things that might make our work better, right? It might, it's not the stuff that makes our schools better or our work better. Instead, it's very specifically about um, the return of indigenous land and life, right? So they're using a very narrow definition, just kind of reminding us that those things are not, uh, we can't compare it to other things, right? The sort of general professional development we might do is not decolonization, right? It's important to learn these things, but the actual process is, is action oriented. 
I like this as a, as a starting point too, because it reminds us that indigenous laws and epistemologies, don't mind the, um, the spelling mistake there, I'll change it when I send this out. But indigenous laws and epistemologies exist un undergirding sort of any processes of colonization, right? So no matter what we are sort of mapping out, there's going to be a group of people and a group of, of ways of understanding the world that are situated in the place that we're talking about, which really takes us now to this next section here. In thinking about situated knowledges. So situated knowledges are knowledges that are land-based. They are tied to the land system. They're tied to the people that are, are, own, that are uh, cared for by that land and who care for that land. And what I think um, in, in a lot of ways, this concept is quite challenging for many people. In discussions around land back recently, Indigenous people are articulating the need for land to be still under Indigenous jurisdiction. So the need for land to return to sort of the control of Indigenous people. Now, a lot of people get confused by this and they say, you know, is this private property to private property? You know, is the, is the homestead that my family has been on for hundreds of years going to be given to a, an individual Indigenous person? And that's really sort of the tension that we see here, right? Instead of sort of an individual concept of ownership, we're working within a collective ownership that isn't even really ownership. It's more like collective responsibility. So this is um, the editor's note from a magazine called Briar Patch that ran a special land back issue in 2020. This is from the editorial collective, uh, Nikita Longman, Alex Wilson, Emily Riddle, and Saimi Desai. And in their editorial, they talk a little bit about land as a system as well, rather than a sort of a, um, an asset that can be owned. And so here they say, we want the system that is land to be alive so that it can perpetuate itself and perpetuate us as an extension of itself. So when we speak about situated knowledges, we're not sort of uh, sitting with things that are assets or something that can be owned. Rather, it's the process of seeing ourselves as part of this system, right? That land is a system. And when we talk about land, it's also not just simply the soil, right? <laughs> it's also all the things that make it up, right? It's the water flowing through it. It is absolutely the, the dirt, the minerals that are tied to that. It's also animals, insects, people, um, air. It's all of sort of the things that make up this system, right? Plants, all of it kind of exists within that. There's lots of ways that we can kind of refer to that in other, in other, with other terms, but through kind of the rhetoric of land back, we use land in this metaphorical way to mean kind of that entire system. Now you notice that in this process, right? It's that idea of the perpetuation, that ongoing sustainability. And so when we're thinking about mapping that, it's something that is persistent, right? And so oftentimes we talk about what has been supplanted without speaking about the sustainability that is built into those systems, right? So we wanna think about, yes, there has maybe been an intervention in that system, but in what ways does it persist, right? In what ways does it kind of build in sustainability? That's the first part. And the other part is that as human beings, we are part of that, we are an extension of that system. So not a separate ownership, but rather a collective responsibility for that. So when we consider situated knowledges um, that maybe have been supplanted or have been intervened in by colonialism, identifying that is a really important component of this work to really understand the context of, of how colonialism has functioned in the space that you're thinking about. Now let's delve into some of these tips. I wanna leave a lot of time for, for thinking about this. Um, I also have, and I'll, I'll stop the, I'll um, move to some of the examples, but we have examples of three different projects of map the system projects that have done some of this work and I'll identify some of these tips in their work. So the first thing that I would tell you to consider when you're working through these in your groups is really to consider those additional structures of domination, right? So rarely will, one form of domination like bigotry be the only system, right? We have to kind of go broad, think about white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, all these other systems of domination that exist, right? Bell Hooks work can help you sort of articulate what, which of these systems might be interlocking with the one that might be the sort of biggest push 
in what you note. So think about those additional structures of domination. And remember that depending on the issue that you're looking at, those structures of domination may have a similar pattern to other things that you've experienced or to other kind of map the system examples, but they're always going to be kind of specific to the issue that you find, right? The oppression that exists in your context is gonna be specific. So articulating that is a good way of beginning to map out how colonialism continues to function. The second um, tip that I have for you is to really think about history. So look back in time, be able to map out sort of the origins of where these things come from. Remembering that colonialism is a structure and it's not an event, it didn't just sort of happen once and it's over with. And so mapping the history of that system is always necessary. This is something you do anyways and map the system, but oftentimes we can look at the way that a system has um, evolved or it's changed in that process, right? Um, good examples are the ways that um, residential schools, so taking Indigenous kids away from their families to, for, to encourage assimilation, that has similarities now in the child welfare system, right? And so even though residential schools are, no, are don't exist anymore since 1996 in Canada, we still have ongoing child welfare, an ongoing child welfare system that continues to remove Indigenous kids from their families, right? And so even though we can sort of say residential schools, they're done, there's a number of things that are happening there, right? One is that the pain of residential schools um, continues, right? So that intergenerational uh, trauma continues, but also the system of removing children has also continued under a different name. So we sort of have to think really thoughtfully about the way that history evolves and changes, but the structures may continue. The third thing that I'll talk to you, that I'll remind you of as a tip, is thinking about what has been displaced, right? Colonialism in large part is a process of displacing epistemologies, right? Replacing the ways that we understand the world, replacing um, uh, situated knowledges. And so in order for the system that you've identified to thrive, what has been destroyed, right? What used to exist, what has been destroyed, what's been supplanted, really we're asking what had to die for this to, to thrive, right? And so sometimes when we're thinking about systems, um, even thinking about systems that are quite benevolent, right? We can think about something like a healthcare system, which is so helpful to us. It saves a lot of lives. Um, we can also think about, well, what existed before that, right? What was the process of healthcare that existed before our particular example of hospitals and, and you know, medi centers and individual doctors, what existed before that, right? So think about that process of displacement and what has been destroyed in that process. The fourth thing that I will um, note is thinking about context. And so <laughs> all of you are coming from different places. Your issues are, are very broad. Um, and while colonialism has similar patterns worldwide, right? So whether we are looking in, <laughs> whether we're looking in New Zealand, whether we're looking in, you know, Rwanda, whether we're looking in Canada, in all of these places, there are both patterns of genocide, of land theft and epistemicide, right? So the killing of a knowledge system, right? We see that happening. That's, that's the process of colonialism worldwide. However, despite those similar patterns that maybe connect Indigenous people worldwide around how that has happened, those situated knowledges that it destroyed or that it was interacting with are unique because they're land-based, right? There's going to be an entirely different way of understanding the world if we're based in a desert versus if we're based in a rainforest, right? And so those situated knowledges drastically change the context because the people, the societies that emerge from that land are a reflection of that, right? From an Indigenous perspective, we see that in that way. So it's important when we think about the context that makes up our own spaces, our own issues, and asking ourselves what Indigenous place-based knowledges exist in your context. Now, sometimes this might be challenging to find, right? In places where colonialism is drastically, it's been ongoing for hundreds of years, it can be sometimes challenging to identify those things, right? Those place-based knowledges. However, they exist, right? And they sometimes might exist in what we might call culture, right? And so thinking about, is there sort of a cultural component to this work 
that actually emerges from a situated knowledge that had been supplanted or that makes up the context that we're talking about in your particular issue. So thinking about, you know, what is that situated knowledge? The last tip that I'll, I'll talk about is, is one that I think is quite important. And that is identifying voices of experience. So when we're looking at evidence, when we're drawing together these broad ideas, we wanna think about the people who have experienced colonialism. So when we sort of sit within library research, I'm a librarian, I'm well aware of how this works, but so much of the research that we have, particularly about colonialism, is extractive research. So this kind of draws from Adam Godry's idea of a research that generally outsiders will come in, they will maybe talk to people, they will extract knowledge from a group of people, go away, and present that information to an entirely different third party who really has no lived experience in what is being discussed. Now, the thing about extractive research is that most of our research history is filled with it. So for hundreds of years, for example, the only people writing about Indigenous people were non-Indigenous people. It's only in, I would say, the last uh, 50 years that we really see more Indigenous academics, more Indigenous researchers even having access to these spaces. Now, this is not because people are not interested in having these discussions. Rather, it's because people have been systematically dehumanized, right? And so it's not simply a process of people not wanting to write about their experiences, but rather um, systematically being barred from being part of things like law, like publishing, like education, right? These areas where um, it was illegal for Indigenous people, for example, to take part in these processes. In Canada, there is a section of time where Indigenous people weren't allowed to hire a lawyer. So you can imagine kind of the process that it pushed them out of all these legal systems that they were not allowed to participate in. So the call to identify voices of experience really helps us to privilege these voices of people who actually experience these things, right? It's pushing back against these systems of extractive research. It's not to say that extractive research, sort of older historical accounts are not useful evidence. Often they're really helpful to us for really like <laughs> clearly laying out what, how these structures have existed. But rather what it does is it helps us to get a much fuller sense of how the map has, ha has been created, right? Because we're, we're dealing with people who have experienced this process rather than people who have enacted it, right? The people that experience oppression know the oppressor better than the oppressor knows themselves, right? And so when we identify those voices of experience, it enables us to kind of bring additional authority to our work. So these tips are places where I would start. As you can imagine, they're very general. <laughs> they're, um, they really depend on kind of the issue that you are choosing to map out. Because uh, as you can see, those structures of domination, the history, what's been displaced, what's the context, and who your voices of experience are, all of that's going to be different based on what you're looking at. So I'm just going to hit escape here. I'm going to bring us um, some examples. Oh, Teen Vogue, that's the one that we just looked at. Here we go. So I want to show you some examples of, um, of projects that have looked at this. So this was a group that was looking at perpetual violence um, and uh, violence against Indigenous women. Let's move this slightly. And so this was a group that was looking kind of specifically at a Canadian context. And you'll note that in this first section, they really are doing that process of history mapping, right? To kind of give us a sense of this, you know, the problem of murdered and missing Indigenous women in Canada specifically is, is really kind of rooted in a longer history. So you can see in their first kind of, um, in this first section, they're really kind of looking at um, the impact of policies of history that have, have integrated with that. You'll also see over here, they're looking at the sort of stakeholders, right? And they're, they're positioning it also within an Indigenous epistemology, where they're using TP, um, they're using TP poles to consider how these things all intersect, right? They're br being brought together, and they're thinking about how we are called to be part of this process as well. This next section that you can see from there is as 
obviously these are thinking about the ideologies. And so that's thinking about the epistemologies that not only sort of exist at their un at their undercurrent, but we also see what has, has been plopped on top of it because of colonialism, right? And so they're including things like stakeholders, that legislation and other people, other stakeholders that are there. Now this doesn't necessarily kind of specifically talk about what's underneath it, but it talks about all of those kind of interlocking systems of domination that exist, right? We see things like assimilation, the push for racism, sexism, all of these things interacting with each other there. We also see here, there's the process of, um, of, of seeing the way, that, again, this interlocking, right? The way that um, one thing exists not in isolation, which is sort of the whole point of map the system, but we can see the, the way that these um, challenges, these solutions, um, the way that they are interlocking, even when we suggest a solution, what is going on with that too? We can see also, obviously, these mental models. And so I think this is a useful one. I really like the way that they've talked about history there. It really kind of, for me, illustrates this process that it isn't sort of one thing that has um, contributed to murdered and missing Indigenous women, but rather a process of history. The next one I'll show you is this one here, Women, Violence, and Modern Slavery. Um, this has some beautiful things. I'm just going to look, I'm just going to show you the visual map because I think that it's a good place to start. We'll open it in Word. So part of me as I slowly open that. Oh, it's in Canva. Uh, so just give me a sec here as I start this out. Oh, it's opening it. I think that's fine. Yes, I want to continue. All right, let's see if we can find it here. Thank you, Microsoft Word. Let's see if we can do it this one. Yes, okay. So if anyone was someone who worked on this, you might be familiar with it. Obviously in map the system, we're used to seeing these interlocking systems, but let's just scooch in a little bit more and look at to see what's going on. So they're looking at, for example, uh, the system of, again, we see sort of these interlocking systems. And I'm just gonna click on here because I think that will take us there. The concept that religion is patriarchal. So these are two sort of systems of oppression that are kind of hand in hand and they've mapped out exactly how that looks, right? The way that religion in this way functions in order to uphold patriarchal systems and patriarchal systems function to uphold um, religious oppression in that way as well. So we can see that connection that exists there. In here too, I'm just trying to like pull in, misallocation of international aid is a great example of the way that we see that extractive research sometimes existing, right? And extractive research isn't the only thing that can be extractive, but rather that even solutions can be extractive as well, right? Outsider solutions that get plopped onto the system that sort of fail because they fail to understand the situated knowledges that undergird this big question, right? And so we kind of sit in a space where um, this is something like the misallocation of international aid functions within kind of um, the inability to identify voices of experience here. One of the other things I'll talk about is again that financial, um, I'm just trying to see where it is. Ah, yes, this is it, the commodi commoditization of women, right? And so when we think about a, a concept like this, we can really think about the way that um, women, how are women in, existing in this cultural space? How has that been supplanted by processes of colonization? How has that experience of, of womanhood shifted, right? How has that been impacted by the processes of colonization? So that's one that I think it does a really interesting job of articulating those interlocking systems of, of domination, but also really gesturing towards this, the situated knowledges that have been supplanted. Let's move this out of the way. The last one I'll show you is this one that is looking at food in, um, insecurity. I'll just look through. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Nat Natalie. It is, it's, it's, you know, colonization is an ongoing structure, right? It's not simply an event, it, it's ongoing. So this one is really looking at kind of, it's a very um, statistics heavy focus, um, which is a great way to sort of capture our attention, but it also gives us a very 
good sense of the context, right? They're talking about Canada, they're breaking it down kind of within British Columbia, the province, and then they're speaking even more specifically about Indigenous households. So this does a good job of sort of giving us the exact context that we're talking about, right? Sometimes in our challenge of mapping the whole system, we go so big, right? And it is really helpful to have some sense of scope when we're talking about who this affects, right? The, always the challenge with map the system is as we start mapping, we go big and big and big. Obviously, there's always going to be some scope that we need to inter, um, intervene with, right? And, and I don't say this to kind of make it be like, give you the, the give you the restriction of what we would might see in sort of a, a research essay, but rather that all of these things are always all connected. And so you'll always have to kind of identify what your scope is. This does an excellent job of continuing to provide good context, right? So when we think about those situated knowledges, they're talking about specifically in BC, how does food insecurity um, manifest and what existed before, right? So this slide I think does a very good job of defining that, thinking about it in that way, but then also grounding it in this space, right? What do we mean by Indigenous people? 198 diverse First Nations in BC. We also have what are the traditional foods? So in, a, in opposition to food insecurity, what could have existed, right? What could have sustained traditionally harvested and processed foods such as salmon, game meats, shellfish, right? So that's really specific to the West Coast, to BC, right? Because obviously food insecurity for Indigenous people in other provinces is going to look different. So remember to keep your focus, remember to really articulate the context that you're existing within. We also have all kinds of things that are talking about here. There's a beautiful map. In this map, and I know that it's a little bit hard to see, I'll just zoom in a little bit more. In this map, I want you to know things like culture as a determinant of health, as well as things like ecosystem diversity. Those similarly are, are noting the situated knowledges, right? Ecosystem diversity kind of ties into what we saw from that briar patch example, where they were speaking about, you know, land as a system, thus we can refer to it as an ecosystem as a good example, but that diversity that exists to sort of enable us to perpetuate it and for it to perpetuate us. Culture as a determinant of health is a lovely way to articulate the situated knowledges that the, through the process of being destroyed or supplanted um, now affect other systems, right? And so we can see that in that one there. So this does a good job of articulating the context I find, and then also doing a really excellent job of gesturing towards what has happened before. All right, so I'll just head back here. And I think now we just did a quick discussion there it's really a chance for question and answer. So I will, actually, I think I can probably stop sharing my screen and I'll allow people to, to ask any questions. I wanted to leave a lot of space for people to think through this. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'm happy to answer questions that relate to your own context, ones that show up. Yeah, I've got, I see there's one hand there, go ahead. Um, hi, Jesse. thank you so much for that presentation. It was really, really great. Um, so for our topic, it's not explicitly related. So I'm, I'm based in North Carolina in the US and it's our topic is not explicitly related to um, indigenous cultures here in North Carolina, but of course, like just being in the US, it's, it's a part of everything. Um, and the history of the US was really built on that. So I'm a little, I'm struggling on how to incorporate, like where can we incorporate Indigenous histories and voices explicitly without taking right. away from the scope of our topic and rather adding to it? Yeah, that's a great question. I've had students come to me with that exact question. I think one of the things that is really helpful, especially within a North American context, I can't speak as much for, you know, Oceania or other spaces, but I could, I could give some context. But I think for us, it's that the processes of things like ownership, of the way that um, economy functions is largely based on land theft and slavery, right? And so those two things are undergirding everything we do, no matter what our issue that we're mapping is. Oftentimes it's how we sort of connect that dot, right? 
And so it's sort of, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of like the air we breathe in that it's hard to map because it doesn't sort of stick out as an, as an intervention because we're constantly engaged in it. So I would say, think about in the North Carolina <laughs> kind of context, think about what the process of Indian removal was in that space and what did slavery look like in that space as well, right? Because I think that that's a really, those two things are, are constantly intertwined in a North American context, right? And, and are, often, <laughs> are often played against each other, right? And so um, I don't know what, what else your issue might be, but that's kind of what I would do is, is think about how that, that's a foundational process. How does it appear in, in your work, right? And it doesn't have to be a, a long kind of heavy process on talking about the statistics, but look at how that, the history of that, that undergirds it has emerged in the issue that you're mapping out. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, I think I have, there's another hand up here, Chloe. Yes, hi, um, thanks so much, Jesse. This has been great. Um, I have a quick question on your point about extractive research and seeking out um, voices of people who've had, you know, that direct experience. What advice would you give, um, you know, to do this in the right way without tokenizing people, without overburdening them? They've obviously been um, hurt by the system. And so you don't want to come in as this outsider just seeking information for your own purposes. Um, so how do you kind of keep that in check and do that in the right and appropriate way? That's a, a great question. I think Tash and I have had some experience working with the team that was looking at murdered and missing women in Canada. And they were like, we want to talk to people. And it was like, ah, let's just put the brakes on it a little bit and think about maybe the harm that we can do, right, in that process. Because <laughs> I think that the excitement of it is like, oh my gosh, yes, we want to, you know, privilege people's voices. We want to make sure that they're heard. A lot of times, however, it's a space where we can seek out stuff that has already been created, right? We can seek out materials that are already written by this group of people, videos, documentaries. Sometimes it requires us to do a process of translation, right? If uh, we speak an oppressor's language, we might need someone to help us find works that are in the language of people who have experienced that oppression. So sometimes it's an extra step in that way. I would say that the question that you can always ask yourself and, and the alternative of extractive research that's positioned by um, Adam Godry, who talks about that is insurgent research, right? Insurgent research takes the questions of that group of people and, and enacts them. And they are the final arbiters of what is considered good evidence of, is this good research? They're also the people that decide if the products of research are good. And so if you're thinking about working with a group of people who have experienced oppression and you want their opinion on it, your, pro your processes might have to change drastically and your products of research, what you're creating out of this might also need to affect them, right? So how does your, how does your work actually contribute to their experience? Um, for indigenous people, we've had so many people interested in pathologizing us. And so oftentimes when people come into our communities to sort of fix a problem, it's a problem that we have. We often say, like, you know, we've already had a lot of research on this, right? And, and none of it's really helped. So, the question you can ask is, how would this help this community? And alternatively, as a librarian, my my um, my advice is always, let's stray away from looking for um, at, at re-traumatizing people, and rather. Um, looking specifically at, <laughs> at, at maybe what has been created from that group already, right? Doing good research, finding what exists already, for sure. This happens like for residential schools, people always want to um, interview elders again when there's a, like a wealth of testimonials available online through lots of different organizations. So it's a great question. All right, I have, I think Donna's hand was up next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great uh, presentation, thank you very much. So um, my background is healthcare, and I, um, in the last uh, several years of my practice, I actually um, uh, engaged with Indigenous people um, and felt very comfortable doing so <laughs> uh, because I am a, I'm actually a, a, a Black woman. So I felt very comfortable. Um, I think only I had one negative experience, and uh, but usually I've had a really good experience. Um, anyway, uh, now that I'm in, in a graduate student, looking at a topic for this uh, 
map the system that's more related to Indigenous people, I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and I'm not sure what's the best way to approach it. I want to do this. I want to, I, 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 like, like I said, I'm very sensitive to um, my writings, how I'm interpreting things, how it's coming across. But I don't believe in perpetuating, as you said, right, the negativity, um, pathologizing individuals. So I'm just wondering what's the approach, because the more I, I hear and listen, the more nervous I get. Am I the right person? Should I be <laughs> doing this? Should I, you know, should I have taken uh, a different approach? Should I just focused on on Black people? Like, I, I just, yeah, like I said, I'm just feeling a bit nervous with, the, with, with, with this. Yeah, it's a great question, right? And I think the question that you ask is one that many researchers never ask themselves. Like, am I the right person to be doing this? Is a question that I, I frequently have to prompt students that I work with to actually do, right? Is, is I'm the, am, I, am I the right person to be doing this? It's a great question to start off with. I think what it comes down to is, is how will your work contribute to the work that's already been done, right? So grounding yourself in, in the work that has been done by indigenous people in this area and in kind of the population you're looking at, because by and large, there will always be some work that has been done, whether that exists in academia or whether that's being done in nonprofits, grassroots organizations, all of these spaces already have work that's been done. One of the biggest challenges of extractive research, that mindset is we're gonna come in and we're gonna fix it all, right? No one else has ever had this question before. And so what I would say is, I don't think you necessarily have to change your topic, but really be able to have sort of a literacy in the work that's already been done by the, the, the people. And you already have kind of a relationship with other indigenous people and the work you've done in the past. So you probably have a, a fluency in that space already. I would say the best way to approach it is to really ground yourself in that work, um, surround yourself by those voices of experience and really kind of um, showcase those, right? That's kind of your, the central approach that I would yeah. take in that, in that no, concern. I appreciate yeah. that because I did, uh, yeah. when I left practice, I promised that I would do something related to Indigenous studies, right? So I, this to me is a, a work of passion. I'm doing it for selfish reasons. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I just want to do, do it justice for sure. For sure, yeah. And I think that there's always, you know, among people have ex who have experienced oppression, there's also um, patterns of that, right? And so, you know, our lived experiences can help us give us insight into other people's approaches as well, right? So I think that's a nice, a nice way of approaching it. Okay, I think I had Clayton next. Hi. Yeah, thanks a lot for the, for the presentation. Um, so my, my team is working on designing a bike share system to maximize the potential of urban cycling. And, you know, we've been trying to, we've been trying to figure out how to, you know, because basically we're trying to like provide a service and, you know, our, our, our partners are like local cycling nonprofits that basically advocating like changes to the land, you know, and even if we think it's like, you know, there's climate benefits and whatnot, it's still like, you know, um, you know, still operating, um, you know, in cities and, you know, we've been, you know, looking into the, like the TRC calls for action and especially, especially number 92 about um, the, you know, business and reconciliation as we, you know, operate a, you know, a business, but it feels like, it feels like we're missing something. Yeah, and I think, I, sorry, go ahead. You can finish that. No, no, go ahead. Like, go ahead. So sometimes I think when people have issues that are rooted in urban spaces, um, it, they're like, that's not an Indigenous space, right? Uh, however, they, uh, cities are Indigenous spaces, right? And they're, they're Indigenous land. I think some of the things with, with bike share, I mean, I've seen some other examples of people talking about kind of, you know, uh, issues like this or, or, or solutions like this. I think one of the things to consider is how did we get to this space where urban spaces are very um, hostile to human beings, right? And through that, that's tied to a history of colonization, right? That, that urban spaces as they're designed right now 
come to us from a particular process of domination over land, right? Where we have cars kind of being the, spa the, the privileged vehicle. What are ways that, that considering travel, considering transportation, what did that look like prior to kind of the rise of urbanization, right? And so I would say that it's really a process of mapping history in this one, right? Are there models of transportation sharing that, that you know, come far beyond? We have sort of the, the prevalence of urban spaces ruled by cars, right? And so it's, I think, I think the, the approach that I might take here is, is identifying the history of, of, the, prob of the, the problem space, right? Being the way that we structure cities as being antithetical to human beings, as being antithetical to families, as being kind of antithetical to um, like human powered transportation. So that's maybe the approach that I would take in thinking about the oppressive system here is sort of the urban space. But I'm not sure if that's fully answered your question. You're welcome to answer, ask a follow-up. No, 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 that, that, does, that does provide an interesting direction, you know, and like, you know, I'm based in Winnipeg. So like the, the where the red meets the Cinnaboyne you know, it's just like, it was a train yard for, you know, I don't know how many decades, like a industrial space, like, you know, and that's where we're operating it, Like it's since transformed, but you know, for so sure. yeah, no, it's it definitely some, some good directions on like mapping the history and human power transportation and what was before. Yeah. Winnipeg is, um, you know, the confluence of those rivers is a big part of human transportation of that, of that, have that historical space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Right. So I have a question in the chat from Rashida looking at the decolonization of Africa. Is that too broad? Um, yeah, I would say it's probably maybe too broad. <laughs> um, you know, and it, and it doesn't necessarily be, just, I don't want to cut it down, right? I think the decolonization of Africa is a very worthy topic. I do think it's harder to map these systems when we are looking at an entire continent, right? And so be, it's, it's grounding us in that context question, right? Of the context of decolonization in the Horn of Africa looks very different from in like West Africa, right? And so we're dealing with um, very disparate places and very disparate knowledge systems that have been supplanted by really different kinds of colonialism too. So I would say that one way to kind of focus in on it would maybe be a look a region might be one way to focus or thinking about as you suggested yeah land restoration indigenous economy um, there's some ex examples of people who have looked at you know like economic systems but I think one of the best things you might want to do is look at, at, at um, projects that have happened before that have taken on a similar scope and just see how they've approached it that's what I would kind of do um, Tash, I don't know if there's anything else you would add to that question. I would say it's the scope is big for sure. The scope is really big. Um, the only thing that I would add on, we do have some that do look at things as a country or as a full continent, um, similar to the missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada one was a huge Canada wide context. Um, and so when you are approaching from that level of things, you have to keep in mind that you are looking at a system that involves many other systems inside of it. So with the example of MMIW, they were looking at Canada as a whole, and then their subsystems were actually really large systems in themselves, such as the criminal justice system, the child welfare system, um, the you know <laughs> Indian agent system. These are all different things embedded into one thing. So when you narrow in, you're actually narrowing in on a really large thing on itself. Um, so kind of that generalization, you have to be able to take that language and be consistent in that language all the way through your project. So you can do it on a really large scale um, that you have suggested, such as all of Africa. Um, but similar to what Jesse brought up, you are going to have to distinguish between these different variances of how things are experienced in various areas by different people, um, who colonized, how they colonized, um, and be able to speak on that really high level area and recognize that that will have different impacts based on land, based on people, all in one geographic area. Um, so we normally would recommend narrowing 
going in a little bit more, whether that's on a social area or using the Oxford track theme areas, so health, um, economic, I can't remember all four off the top of my head, but there's four track areas. Um, and so using one as a guiding principle. Um, if you go to our Map Assistant Canada website, there is the different track areas along with examples in each track areas um, that you can use. And they'll kind of give an economic track um, example. Some of them are really wide scale such as this and others are more narrowed in. So it can be done, um, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I would say too, to your follow-up question, honestly, I think there is no region too small. We've seen great projects that literally look at a neighborhood within a city, right? And so um, we often go big, <laughs> but even a small, honestly, scope helps us do an, a better map in many ways, right? Because um, if we take on all of Canada or all of Africa, uh, there's like Tash was saying, there's so many large systems that we have to contend with. Sometimes it doesn't allow us to sort of get into the complexities, the intricacies that exist within that. But I'll leave it up to you. I think Amy has popped um, those theme tracks in the chat. And so that might be a good way to, to define your scope. Um, Hiba, I think you have your, your hand up as, again, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you again. Um, I was just curious if you could point us in the direction of any like indigenous uh, scholars and any methods they have developed that we could potentially incorporate. Because I, I have a classmate in one of my systems thinking classes and she like really, you know, wisely pointed out that systems thinking is sort of, it was not invented by like academic universities <laughs> um, and it's yeah. really like an indigenous way of thinking. Um, at least for her, from her experience. So I just want to know if you have any um, methods we could use to inform our analysis. Yeah, I think it. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think that this way of thinking about the interconnectivity. You know, when we looked at that quote from the Briar Patch Magazine special issue. You know, thinking about the system that is land that we are a part of it, that we have collective responsibility. All of that really ties in nicely with with map the systems um, values around how things are so tied together. I think that honestly, your context will um, determine the sort of processes that you want to follow, right? So we're here in Calgary, we're here in Southern Alberta. If I was doing something that related to this space, even though I'm not from this space, I wouldn't rely on my own um, conception of a Cree conception of the world. Rather, I would be turning to Blackfoot, Nakoda, Sutina perspectives on the way of thinking about it, right? Because that's the the that's the systems thinking that makes sense within this context, right? The other thing to do is look at, I think, broad examples um, like Yellowhead Institute, which comes out of X University, Ryerson University, um, which is an indigenous think tank. They've pulled together things like policy documents, uh, red papers, sort of these examples of the way that they might think through specific, uh, to ex specific issues. And so I would maybe start there. I think Yellowhead Institute is a great place to start. These kinds of institutes exist no matter what your topic is. Um, so looking to see who's doing this work. I think it's similar to the question that Donna had, who's already doing this work, right? Who's already kind of thinking through these issues as indigenous people. And so, and, and when it comes to that, it's always a question of articulating the collective term that might make sense for your context, right? The term indigenous, is always a, a, a term that lacks something because um, like one of those Map the Systems projects articulated, it doesn't deal with the complexity of people, right? And so if we're looking at something that's relevant to our process, we might need to think about alternative terminology for Indigenous people. Are we talking about specific nations? Are we talking about Blackfoot people, for example? Are we talking about, you know, an entire region, plains, plateau people, that kind of thing. So yeah, sometimes it might require a little bit of brainstorming around the terminology of what we actually even call Indigenous people in that space, but yeah, that's a great question. But yeah, starting there to see what other people have done is a great way to, to begin this process. I think there's another one in the chat box here. It says... Um, from Sabah, Sabahi. Um, apologies if I pronounce. Oh yes, Sabahad. Yes. Okay. So we're looking at energy poverty in remote communities in northern Canada. Yes, I would say that this is really a process of of history mapping as well, right? And so, 
Um, this is a question that has, has been a big source of concern in communities in Northern Canada for a very long time. Um, it's often a process of looking at what has been um, suggested, what has been tried, what has failed, and what ways that those failures have happened, right? Um, a lot of times when people look at the North, I think they frequently see it as, you know, the great white North, sort of this empty space um, with Inuit sort of existing in the same way for many years. And there is sort of that, that process of maintenance of culture, but there have been so many interventions for people in remote communities um, that sort of sit there. So I would, I would really ground yourself in what's been tried before, what has failed, the ways that it's failed, and also thinking about what has existed in that space before, right? So what is, what is sort of the situated knowledge around energy in the North? Um, because I think that there's so many examples. Um, a great example is when people talk about uh, food insecurity in Northern communities, frequently they will say, well, they just need greenhouses to the point that Inuit are like, no more greenhouses. We are, <laughs> thank you, but no, <laughs> it's not gonna work out that way. So look at the, at the processes that, that pre-exist um, uh, urbanization, that pre-exist colonization in those spaces. Um, because when we think about renewable solutions, oftentimes those situated knowledges give us a, a way forward for that. But yeah, that's a really interesting topic. I would, I would start there. The other thing to look at there is um, uh, company town mentality, right? And so the way that many companies in the North sort of come in, provide services, and then also leave and sort of leave a community without kind of important infrastructure. So relying on, um, on companies to provide infrastructure rather than more sustainable projects. So look at sort of the, I would say, look at the failures of what has happened before. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure if I missed any in the chat. I'm just looking to see. I don't think you missed any. I'll just throw it out there that we do probably have time for one more question before we let Jesse go here. Um, so if anyone has a question, please feel free to drop it into the chat box or um, you can unmute yourself at this time. Yeah, I just saw Natalie's post and so thinking about that divide and conquer strategy it's one that we can frequently map out right in the way that um <laughs> control over one group of people has often happened it's it's something that we often see right and and i think there is a question i mean when we think about that undercurrent or the the you know land theft indigenous removal and slavery as the two things that really ground specifically american contexts um, that divide and conquer really exists in that space there for sure. So yeah, thanks for that question or that comment. All right, I think CJ, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks again for taking the time to present this session as a whole. Um, I have a question just based in language. So my project is centered on how language is used and how especially non-English languages are represented, um, especially in like digital contexts, which is predominantly English, at least in the Western speaking world. So I'm curious to hear about um, any perspective truthfully on how to approach looking at indigenous languages, especially as they're Romanized or Latinized, and how to start to approach understanding indigenous languages on their own terms using their own terminology? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Are you looking specifically at orthographies, like the written component of it? Uh, truthfully, I haven't come across that term quite yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm looking at Chinese languages, so I mean, yeah, that's the okay. context I'm coming from, but mm -hmm. um, just, yeah, trying to better understand languages as spoken, I think is the right. most important part. So understanding like how to communicate when you're face to face with someone, but also a big part of that is how you write, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I think, um, so there's some excellent work that's been done on sort of the primacy of English. So when we have sort of a, sh a shared English language, and that has been so tied to colonization, what that has done to language systems, whether that is the way that language is spoken or the way that language is written, we have lots of examples of missionaries coming in and, and standardizing processes of, of written language. I know that looks slightly different for certain Asian languages, for sure. Um, but that process of standardization often appears, and that's a process of colonization that we can we can track, right, and in, in how that appears. 
we also can, I would also look at maybe processes of education. So how does language acquisition happen? How does education tie into that? How is that always affected by um, bigger structures of what we consider good citizens to be or what we consider sort of good people to be? And so those are all gonna kind of, I think, interweave into your discussion of, of language. I think that um, this is a big and interesting question. And I think that um, really looking at people's experiences of speaking, like, I think this is a process of really grounding yourself in voices of experience, right? Of the people who have taught language, the people who have experienced having to learn another language when they go to school, of language shift as it happens. I think that's kind of gonna, that would be my suggestion to you is to really lean into those voices of experience because for sure there will be many outsiders who have weird opinions about this topic grounded in the people that are actually speaking those languages, I would say. Yeah, so it's such an interesting question. Thank in you. terms of approaching Indigenous languages, there's lots of work being done in this area. Um, I would look at the sort of solidarity movements between, um, it sometimes it's called mother tongue um, languages. So the return to our mother tongues, the, tongue, the, the languages we grow up with, the need that, to take on new languages as we go into education. And so there's some solidarity between language groups if we use that phrasing, like um, mother tongue is, is something that shows up a lot. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. All right, everybody, we are going to wrap up our session here today. I thank everyone again for um, attending and being so vibrant in your questions. Um, I truly wanna thank Jesse for joining us today.